SLD අලුත් මෙගා ලයින් කනෙක්ෂන් වලට 150ක දීම නා තවත් ඔෆර් ගැන දැනගන්න 1 2 1 2 කම තන්න Tonight in the hands of fate Speaker Karu Jayasurya hints at readiness to undertake a bigger role. What a difference 2 weeks make. Heavy falls accompanied by thunder showers set to lash the island. Now we are in the winter monsoon season so possibility for afternoon thunder showers is still high over the island. Assiduous justification. Minister of Sports yet again defends the SLC squad selection for the World Cup. But a former fast bowling coach has questions. We want it all. A subpoena issued demanding the release of Special Counsel Robert Miller's full report. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Saturday, the 20th of April, 2019. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhammi Gekanayaka. Let's start you off with your local stories. Now, Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, urges all to liberate themselves from selfishness in order to find the way to true freedom. The Archbishop made the plea in his Easter, Easter message and proceeded to say that the people should tide over the plague of selfishness that exists in politics, economy, culture or even religion. Easter is a festival of freedom and we know that it commemorates the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on a cross in order to show us how much we should free ourselves from our own selves the easter celebration is an ancient uh, jewish festival where the people of israel who lived in uh, slavery in egypt experienced through faith and through the hand of god freedom where they were freed from slavery in egypt and brought to the land israel but jesus also wanted to speak to us about a new festival a new passover a new kind of going from slavery to freedom he didn't mean this word in a political sense or in a economic sense but he meant to tell us that what is more important is to liberate ourselves from our own sinfulness and selfishness and showed us that the way to true freedom and liberation is in selflessness whether it is selfishness that is economic selfishness that is political selfishness that is cultural or linguistic or religious to tide over this selfishness and that is the meaning of passover and that is the meaning of easter so in this sense along with uh, all the other citizens of this country who believe in religion of the great founders of religion we christians ought to walk the path of selflessness so that we may liberate ourselves completely from the plague of selfishness and i wish each and every one of you a very holy and happy easter god bless you Now opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksha is critical of leaders within the United National Party. He alleges that instead of looking into the necessities of the people, they are busy fighting with each other over the party's leadership. The opposition leader was speaking to media in Nuwarelia today where he also insisted that some manner of election should be held. Opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksha who is currently in Nuwarelia met with the Tamil business community in the region. <laughs> Holding the presidential election this year is a must. Moreover, the provincial council election has been postponing for 2 years now. Be it the presidential, general or provincial council, elections must be held. That's called democracy. The responsibility of a government is not to postpone elections because they're scared to face them. What happened was Minister Premadasa publicly accepted that this government committed the bond scam. This is the deputy leader of the United National Party speaking. Their game is to conspire against each other and fight for the leadership, but they're not worried about the necessities of the public. 
Speaker Karu Jayasuriya was in Kandy today as he called on the chief prelates of Askiriya and Malwat, the chapters. Speaking to media after having audiences with the prelates, the speaker hinted that he is ready to fulfil a national responsibility. His comments come in a backdrop where the presidential election is expected to be held this year. Speaker Karu Jayasuriya today called on chief prelate of the Askiri chapter, most venerable Varaka Godasri Nyana Ratanathera in Kandy. The speaker then called on the chief prelate of the Malvata chapter, most venerable Tibatwa Vestri Sumangala Thera. Speaker Jai Surya also called on the Anunayaka of the Malvata chapter, most venerable Dimbul Kumbure Vimaladharma Thera. Following discussions with the chief prelates, Speaker Karu Jai Surya then addressed media. This year is a very challenging one for the citizens of this country because several elections are to be held. I will fulfill the responsibility of protecting democracy and ensure that the public are provided with their necessities if fate deals me with whatever opportunity. <laughs> If fate provides me with something, I'll be there to protect democracy. However, I will not ask for anything. <laughs> As I have been saying repeatedly, I don't need to quarrel with anyone for positions. I will only consider holding a position if everyone give their consent. Now, former Defence Secretary Gota Biranj Baksha highlights the importance of ensuring that allegations of corruptions are not repeated against them. He said this addressing yet another seminar of the organisation earlier. Another phase of a forum organised by the organisation Elia got underway at the SDS Jayasinghe Hall in Dehiwala today. The event was held under the auspices of the former Defence Secretary Gota Bir Rajapaksa. Speaker Karu Jayasure, who called on the chief prelates of Askiri and Malwata today, says that he is ready if people are ready. Speaker Karu, it is too late now. We will celebrate the next Sinhala and Tamil New Year under a new leader. Who is that? During the tenure of former President Mahindra Rajpaksha, we proved that we are not a bunch who aren't her words, but a bunch who works. Most people talk about the environment today. We made a drastic change in Colombo, although we didn't speak much about it. During that time, we planted more than 100,000 trees in Colombo. There were no reservoirs in Colombo, but we built a number of artificial reservoirs in the Corte area. How many dilapidated buildings were there in Colombo? How many presidents and prime ministers must have passed them? But those unpleasant buildings remained the same. We changed the situation and converted them to business places and shopping malls. We were accused of certain things those days, and we need to rectify them. There was a lot of corruption allegations against us. Although most of them were baseless allegations, we must make sure they're not repeated. Now, around two weeks ago, the country was clamouring for rain, and now there is, maybe more than what was expected. 
The Department of Meteorology today issued a severe thunderstorm and heavy rainfall advisory for central, Saburagamu, northwestern and western provinces, including several other districts. Meanwhile, a death was also reported after a family was struck by lightning. Sri Lanka felt the searing heat in excess of some 37 degrees Celsius during the recent past. In stark contrast, the weather changed into heavy downpour, causing damages around the country. A 19-year-old succumbed after being struck by lightning in the area of Rambava in Anuradhapura yesterday. Speaking to First at Nine Director of the Forecast Division of the Department of Meteorology, Anusha Varnasurya said that afternoon thunder showers are possible over the island due to the inter-monsoon season. Possibility for afternoon thunder showers is still high over the island, so general public is kindly requested to take adequate precautions to minimize damages caused by lightning activities. Now we are in the winter monsoon season, so afternoon thunder showers is possible on most part of the island, and also fairly heavy falls around 75 millimeters are also possible in western, southern, central, and Sabaragamo provinces. Meanwhile, also speaking to First at Nine Assistant Director of the Disaster Management Centre, Pradeep Kodipili said that the district of Gampa is the most affected area due to strong winds. There are six deaths being reported in this year from January up to now and people need to take precautions to minimize lightning damages. Prevent activities in the already open area. Strong winds being blown over many other areas of Sri Lanka, especially Kampaha, the highest damage has been recorded. These few days time, 161 houses damaged, partially some fully as well. And Kurunagal, 28 houses, Vaunia, Mana, one house each. And Mulatiu, three houses, and Gol, five houses, and Gampaha, 223 houses. So uh, people need to take uh, precautions to trim the trees around their houses to prevent these damages. The dry situation is still prevailing in some areas of Sri Lanka, but the Ministry of Disaster Management already provided the funds and the resources to cope with the prevailing drinking water problem. Several houses were also damaged due to strong winds that blew across the area of Low Lugaswever in Anuradhapura last night. Meanwhile, 10 houses were also damaged in the village of Settikulam in Ipalogama, Anuradhapura, owing to strong winds that swept through the area. Residents claim that there were hailstorms. Meanwhile, the drastic drop in water levels at reservoirs Castlery and Mausakale due to dry weather conditions have now increased by a considerable extent. In the meantime, a UBEL 315 Sri Lankan Airlines flight flying from Kuala Lumpur to Bandarnaka International Airport was diverted this evening to Matala International Airport due to bad weather conditions. Now let's take a look at some other stories making news across Sri Lanka. It is reported that the Karapiti Hospital is facing a waste management problem with the accumulation of garbage leading to the risk of spreading dengue. Mayor of Gaul Priyanta Sahabandhu, however, said that the issue has arisen due to the hospital not properly separating the disposed waste. He added that the unseparated waste makes it difficult to collect. At least 42 persons, including plantation workers of the Laksapana estate in Nalathanya and several children have been admitted to the Maskali hospital with suspected food poisoning. Around seven children as well as 35 men and women who had consumed parcels of food given at an annual festival held at the Hindu Kovil in the estate yesterday were hospitalised after they showed symptoms of food poisoning. According to hospital sources, however, none of them are in critical condition and the Maskelia Medical Officer's Office has launched an inquiry into the incident. Locals caught an 18-foot python which was spotted near the General Hospital of Nagoda in Kaluthara. The python had laid around 20 eggs when it was found and our correspondent said that the serpent was handed over to the Department of Wildlife Conservation. In the meantime, the Department of Wildlife today prevented a group of local and foreign tourists who attempted to travel across the Mullikulam entrance of Mana of the Wilpatu National Park. The group was not allowed to enter the National Park as they were on bicycles. Now there is a new Asia Tea Alliance. We'll bring you the details after this break. Don't go away. are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24.
Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, across the continents, the Asian countries have reportedly generated the highest dollar worth of exported tea last year, with shipments amounting to 4.1 billion US dollars, which is 58.8 percent of the global total. Now, it is in this backdrop that India, China, Sri Lanka, Indonesia and Japan, who are considered as the jumbo tea exporters in the region, have established a union. Injecting hope for further development of the Asian tea industry, the Asia Tea Alliance was established in Guangzhou, China yesterday to create a sustainability, uh, sustainability agenda, that is, for Asian tea. International media reports that a union of five tea growing and consuming countries was launched yesterday in Guizhou, China. Dubbed the Asia Tea Alliance, the union is reported to be consisting of Indian Tea Association, China Tea Marketing Association, Indonesian Tea Marketing Association, Sri Lanka Tea Board and Japan Tea Association. Indian media outlet The Telegraph quotes chairman of the Indian Tea Association Vivek Goenka, who was at the meeting as saying, quote, We have planned to work together to enhance tea trade, cultural exchange, technology exchange, global promotion of tea, enhancing global consumption of tea and creating a sustainability agenda for the future of Asian tea. In the meantime, the Hindu reporting on the new association says that the forging of this alliance comes close on the heels of the signing of a memorandum of understanding in December 2018 between the Indian Tea Association and China Tea Marketing Association. However, when First at Nine contacted the Sri Lanka Tea Board, they said more information on the new alliance will only be announced once the Sri Lanka delegation who are currently in China returns next week. Addressing the ambassadorial level meeting of the Peace Building Commission in New York recently, Minister Mangala Samarivira referred to the reconciliation process, saying that development begins with reconciliation and that it is essential for Sri Lanka to realize its vision of a stable, peaceful, reconciled and prosperous nation for all. Also, touching on the co-sponsorship of UN resolution, the minister said that 40-1, which was a procedural technical rollover of resolution 30-1 of 2015, was a demonstration of the country's commitment to continue working with the UN system. The minister went on to say that through the Peace Building Priority Plan and Peace Building Board, the UN and the government have succeeded in working together to identify areas where assistance is required and to bring on board most bilateral partners, avoiding duplication. Now, Malaysia recently managed to successfully renegotiate a rail project with China, reducing the cost incurred by one-third. The move to review the agreement, inked under the previous regime, was spearheaded by the country's Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed, as he was adamant the cost involved was too high. In a recent interview with China Central Television, Mahathir dealt a blow to some Western propaganda, which attempted to depict China's Belt and Road Initiative as one with an insidious agenda, saying Malaysia is more afraid of Europeans than China. He also raised China, or praised China that is, for playing a part in enabling many countries to reduce their cost of living by reducing cost of production in China. China's Belt and Road Initiative continues to be in the news for all manner of reasons, with certain countries uncertain over the motives and implications of the mega project. With China emerging as a true global power player, the West in particular has been accusing the country of getting a grip of smaller and developing nations through debt. The term coined for the alleged strategy is debt trap and certain Western publications attempt to depict that even Sri Lanka is caught in the so-called debt trap despite the lion's share of the island nation's external debt is not owed to China. One man who has never been shy in standing up to superpowers is Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. With a track record of standing up to the US in the past, Mahathir was adamant in renegotiating a major rail project with China and he succeeded. He managed to reduce the cost of construction by a third and increase the level of local involvement. Despite that being the case, the Malaysian PM isn't averse to China's mega infrastructure project. Long ago, I had advocated the revival of the Silk Road. But uh, what Mr. Xi Jinping said is that besides the Silk Road, he is also taking into consideration the Sea Route. The Sea Route is capable of carrying bigger quantities, using bigger ships, and that will facilitate trade between East and West.
In the promotion of relation between countries, the distance as well as the speed of travel is very important. With this uh, scheme, I am quite sure more ships uh, will be passing near Malaysia and uh, Southeast Asian countries, and therefore it will increase trade between Southeast Asia and China. Malaysian Prime Minister also had an answer to those fear mongers who depict China as a Goliath intent on consuming the world. I have been asked everywhere I go, what, what do you think about China? Aren't you afraid of China? I said, there's nothing to be afraid of. We have had relation with China for almost 2,000 years. China never conquered us. But the Europeans came two years after they came here, they conquered us. So we are more afraid of the Europeans than we are of China. China can play a very big role, not least because it is a very big country. They can play a role in growing the economy of the world by their own action. Even Europe and America would benefit because China is a big market. At the same time, the Chinese have been able to reduce the cost of production which have helped many countries to reduce their cost of living. China has much that it can contribute towards the development of the world, including the developing countries. A subpoena demanding the release of the full report compiled by U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller into Russian meddling during the 2016 presidential election has been issued Amid claims the current version leaves most of the Congress in the dark, Democrat Jerry Nadler, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, urged it is entitled to an unredacted version. The Department of Justice has re uh, reacted by calling the subpoena premature and unnecessary. Congressional Democrats yesterday took a legal step to see all of U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller's evidence from his inquiry into Russian interference in the 2016 election as they consider how to use the probe's findings against President Donald Trump. U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee Chairman Gerald Nadler, a Democrat, issued a subpoena to the Justice Department to hand over the full report by Mueller, saying he cannot accept a redacted version released on Thursday that leaves most of Congress in the dark. The Attorney General's decision to withhold the full report from Congress is regrettable, but no longer surprising. Barr has so far refused to work with the committee to provide us with information kind of information that has been customarily provided in the past and to which the Judiciary Committee is entitled. These concerns and many others will be addressed when Barr testifies before the Committee on May 2nd. Even in its incomplete form, however, the Mueller report, incomplete because part of it is redacted, even in its incomplete form, however, the Mueller report outlines disturbing evidence that President Trump engaged in obstruction of justice and other misconduct. The report provided extensive details on Trump's efforts to thwart Mueller's investigation, giving Democrats plenty of political ammunition against the Republican president, but no consensus on how to use it. The 448-page report painted a clear picture on how Trump had tried to hinder the probe but did not conclude that he had committed the crime of obstruction of justice, although it did not exonerate him. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. Welcome back. It's time for sports. Now, the announcement of Sri Lanka's 15-member squad for the upcoming Cricket World Cup has become the talk of the town, with many pointing the finger at the selectors for several inclusions and glaring omissions. Minister of Sports Harin Fernando, who justified the squad selection yesterday, to other Derna continue to do so today as well. Speaking in Badulla, the minister took aim at armchair pundits who criticised the moves made by relevant authorities on various social media platforms. 
The job of the Minister of Sports is to grant confirmation and recommend the team based on their fitness since they represent the entire nation. I cannot poke my finger unnecessarily, but it has now come to a point where the selectors and I have to consider comments on Facebook before taking decisions. Apparently, that is where all the pundits in sports, politics and economy are. We cannot make decisions that way. There are payments made to selectors and they are veteran players and I believe they love the country. There are questions of the selected squad lacking experience since we faced continuous defeats during the recent past. That said, experience will not do any good if you're not in form and are lacking self-confidence. We had to take a gamble and we as Sri Lankans should support our players without criticizing them. The biggest obstacle to Sri Lanka is the all-knowing attitude. <laughs> Meanwhile, speaking to Adadirana, former fast bowling coach Anusha Samaranayaka voiced his concerns over the omission of former captain Dinesh Chandimal and batsman Lahiru Thirimanna. The former coach went on to say that the biggest problem we now face is the team's inability to bat till the end of 50 overs. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.